Right, just to continue, we're very happy to have Jimmy Gray, who's going to tell us about numerical metrics. So thanks very much. Um, thanks to the organizers for a, a, wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful workshop. I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, most important thing to say right from the start is please do ask questions. So examples of good questions are what is why and huh, right? So just kick in there. And the reason is, is that this, this series that Lara Magdalena and I are doing is sort of split into three parts. There's sort of the information dump part that Lara did where we just give you everything that we, we're going to need on Kalabi hours. And then the two parts I'm going to be doing is about setting up problems, uh, setting up the process of trying to learn a Kalabi hour metric. And this is sort of the, the somewhat pedestrian part in that I'm going to go in, slow down and go into more details because it's the part that you need to know, uh, to know to understand everything else. It's going to be the part where we set up the details of how you actually do this computation. And in particular, I'm not going to talk directly probably about machine learning. I'm just setting up the problem. But if your TensorFlow foo was strong enough, right, and you understood everything in these two lectures, if I do a good enough job, then in principle, you could just sit down and program yourself um, uh, something that's going to learn a Calabian metric. So this is sort of like the guts under the hood, right? And so if you don't ask questions and you get lost, then when Magdalena speeds up again to do covering what's been done in the machine learning setting, which, this is, which is based on this, you're going to be lost. So please do ask questions. If I can't answer them, there's two people in the front row who can. OK, so what are we going to be doing? Well, our goal, as we know, is to find a numerical approximation to a Rishi flat metric. on a club, yeah. And we actually have a plan. Um, and it's, it, the plan is very simple. The only issue is in its, its, its implementation. So what's the plan? It's cunning plan. So what's the plan? Well, first of all, we're going to make an ansatz for the metric. So make an ansatz for G, I, J, bar. And as Lara told us, on these uh, complex manifolds that we're going to be talking about, um, the only component of the metric that's non-zero is the one with these mixed indices, one bud and one unbud. So we're going to just make an ansatz for that. More precisely, we're going to make an ansatz for k, the k the potential. So, and then just take derivatives of it on each patch in a patchwise way to get the metric. So in what I'm going to be talking about, we are going to be wedded strongly to Kähler. Now, if you weren't interested in Calabi hours, you could modify what I'm going to talk about very easily to do other manifolds as long as they were Kähler. So I'm using a Kähler potential, right? There are ways you can modify that and go beyond Kähler. And for example, in the paper that Fabian and Lara and I did, we do that. But then you're going to have to deal with the metric directly rather than going through the Kähler. Potential. So why am I going through the Kähler potential? It's just easier to deal with one function than with a bunch. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to make an ansatz for the Kähler potential. From that, we get the metric. And this ansatz will contain parameters. Which are going to be called h, h for parameter. So just some, to some toggles we can tune. And we're going to find a way. So the first part is we're just going to make this ansatz. We're going to talk about why it has some chance of succeeding, sort of geometrically how you interpret it, that kind of thing. And once we've made this ansatz for what the metric is going to look like, we're just going to find a way to adjust the parameters to adjust h such that Gij bar becomes the Rishi flat object. Of course, we'll never actually get something that is perfectly Rishi flat because we're going to be doing numerics, but we're going to get as close as we can. What will be close enough? Well, we'll talk about it, but the basic answer is we don't know. Because to know how accurate you needed this metric, you'd need to know once you use this metric to compute things you actually care about, like the type of stuff Lara talked about 
physics in a, in a low energy theory, you need to know, okay, how accurate do I need to know the thing I'm computing? How does the error feed forward from the metric to compute things? Um, and, and that would tell me how accurate I need the metric. No one's done any of that stuff. But we want to find some reasonably decent approximation to a Rishi flat metric, and we want to have a measure of how close we are. And as I said, a lot of this setup is exactly what will be used in the machine learning application. Um, and why the machine learning application here is needed, I'll highlight towards the end. Um, but it's set up using a lot of the information I'm going to give here. Now, what kind of Kalabiaus are we going to look at here? Um, so the examples we're going to use, and I'll set up everything in terms of these. I'm just going to do the very simple case that can be expressed in the language Lara introduced in this way. This is going to be a Klabiao that is a hypersurface. It's the zero set of a single equation in Pn. And the equation is a degree n plus one polynomial in the homogeneous coordinates of Pn set it equal to zero. So this is a very simple case. It gives us access to some things, every, well, not everybody, the people who work in this field know and love. So if you do P34, you get K3, two-dimensional guy. If you uh, do P45, this is the Quintic. This is the one that Lara mentioned. And you can keep going. Um, you might be interested in fourfolds, so you can get the sextic fourfold, and so forth. So most of the time, I'll just phrase things in terms of n. Every so often, I might revert to the Quintic, um, and so forth. So why am I doing that? Why am I going to just consider these examples? Well, that's just for simplicity. Generalizations of this to the type of uh, toric ambient, more general toric ambient spaces that various people have mentioned are both not too bad and quite nasty, depending on which aspect of it you're looking at. I think Magdalena may talk about um, some of this uh, when she gets to the machine learning stuff. But for simplicity, we're going to talk about this lot. And, and for the classical applications where we're just using old fashioned numerical techniques to try and find this, this metric, this covers basically the entirety of the literature. There's a few cases where people have done other things, but almost all the literature is finding metrics on the quintic. We'll see why that is as we go along. Talking of the literature, so that's the plan, right? We're going to find Rishi flat metrics on these type of things following that, um, that method. I should say none of this is mine, right? Um, so I'm just doing some setup material for the machine learning part. Um, and I'm borrowing heavily from people's stuff in preparing the lectures, which is why you should ask questions because you may see some of the uh, notation going uh, haywire as I've tried to like, you know, make the, the notation consistent. But, but I, should, I should give you some, some references that I'm taking this from. And, and these are, I'm a physicist. So these are references that are sort of physicist friendly introductions to the material. Um, so Douglas et al um, have a couple of papers. So this is Douglas, Karp, Lukic and Reinbacher. These are HEP TH 0612075 and 0606261. Um, so these were some of the first works in the physics literature, learning metrics, and in fact, gauge field. Apologies on um, Calabia manifolds as well. Um, and this used one of the approaches that we're going to talk about to, uh, so everything I'm going to talk about uses this ANSATS uh, for finding the metric, but you just use one particular approach for finding the, the parameters in the ANSATS, it will be really flat. Another paper I'm going to use is Hedrick and Saar, which is an HEPTH. Two, six, three, five. Um, and these are the guys that sort of pioneered the other approach, which can turn out to be in many respects more successful for, for finding these parameters in the ansatz. Hedrick also has some notes on his web page that are called something like strategy for world domination. Um, so if you look at those, they're really great because it's sort of an informal set of notes where he actually does the algebra, right, which is sometimes really helpful. And then lastly, just because they give um, a really nice description of some of the more formal um, some of the more formal um, 
theorems that come up and so forth really nicely stated. There's an Anderson et al. So that's Anderson, Braun, Karp, and Overett. Uh, and that you can find here in HEP theory. 10044399. And that's probably some of the last references I'll give. Right. So I, I'm not trying to be exhausted. Yes. Please. Once you find this metric, I'm curious how hard is it to find the low energy observables? That's a great question. So like I'm going to just spend all this time talking about just finding the metric. And then the question is, is how hard is it then to find the observables? Really hard, even with the metric. So I don't know. So, so, so let's, let's just talk about that for a second. So what would you in principle have to do right, to get something that you actually care about? The one thing you might actually care about, um, say, is the matterfield kähler potential. So this is basically a, an item in the effective field theory that will give you the kinetic terms, the kinetic energy of the matter fields in the theory. That is not known in the heterotic compactification beyond very simple examples. So what would I need to do that? I need the Klabian metric, first of all. Then I would need to find a solution for the gauge fields that are present on that Klabian. So that's solving a set of equations that look like this, which you can see immediately depends on said Klabian metric. So you'd have to solve these equations and get a gauge field. Um, Douglas et al. are doing a first example of that. Once you had those equations, in principle, what you would have to do is you now have a metric and a connection on a gauge field, or a gauge field on a club, yeah. You'd now have to work out the gauge covariant derivative, form a Laplacian from it, and find the harmonic zero modes of the Laplacian. No one has ever done that for the gauge Laplacian. Once you did that, you could take the Hodge dual of one of those, wedge it with the, the thing you first thought of, so you take star, if omega is your, eigenvalue of Laplace and you take star omega wedge omega integrate it over the club yeah that's the thing you care about that is a lot of steps and no one has ever done it basically because these classical methods I'm going to talk about do not get the job done you can get the so people have done so well, our illustrious lecturer over here has found um, some eigen modes of various operators on club yeah but no one has gone as far as getting that Kähler potential right They didn't go all the way back. Yeah. The right. But I, as I understand it, they don't actually have the Kähler potential, and certainly not the Kähler potential as a function of the moduli, which is the thing you'd actually need, right? Yeah. So why have people not done that? Well, people have not done that because certainly the methods I'm going to talk about today just aren't really good enough to get you that far, I would think. I mean, someone may come along and prove me wrong. I mean, maybe you may have some ideas. But, one of the hopes would be, I, I feel like the machine learning implementations of these, these methods are at early days. They, as we talk about as we go along, they solve many of the problems we've had. Maybe they are going to be enough to get us all the way. Yeah. I'll actually talk about this more at the end, but it's a great question. You know, Is this going to be good enough? And the answer is I don't know. Cool. OK, so I just wrote in the middle of the board for no reason. I'll just. Good, so um, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna start by setting up some notation and then we're gonna talk about metric ansatzes. Once we've talked about metric ansatzes, then we'll talk about tuning those parameters that come up. Um, let's see how we do. So let's start with just some basics. So this is metric ansatzes. Is it ansatzes? Anyway. Metric things. And then we'll just start with some basics on PN. And just to set my notation, so homogeneous coordinates on PN are going to be uh, ZA with A equals one to N plus one or zero to N, depending on your preferences. The patches that I'll use at least initially are just gonna be the same ones that have been discussed, ZC not equal to zero. So ZC equals zero is a closed set, so it's complements an open set. Those open sets for all the different ZC cover the manifold. And then I'm gonna define some quantities U, A, C. Oh, I am too short. 
UAC, which are just the quotients of the homogeneous coordinates. So these are affine coordinates on the patch C. Right, you divide through here so that, remember these homogeneous coordinates are equivalent up to scaling, now the scaling cancels out. So these are homogeneous coordinates. Um, uh, if A is not, e uh, these are affine coordinates on the patch C. If A is not equal to C and if A equals C, obviously it's fine. Just some notation. So what metrics do we have? What metric ansatzes can we write down? Well, on PN, you can write down a bunch of metrics. And the first thing you can write down is the famous Fubini study metric, which I think has already been mentioned. And I'm gonna spell this wrong and I'm gonna pronounce things wrong and I apologize to it. So let's start with this guy who's the, gonna be the key player. And on a patch C, we could write the Kähler potential for Fubini study as log of GAB bar Z A Z bar B bar over mod Z C squared. This is gonna be a Hermitian matrix. That makes this thing real. This is a good function on PN because the, again, the scaling cancels out. So you don't have two different descriptions of the same point giving a different function. So this is the Fibonacci study Kähler potential. Take two derivatives of it, you'll get a metric. And if you use my definition up there, this is the same as GAB bar, UAC, U, and even close brackets if you want. Okay. Okay. As always, you just take two derivatives to get the metric. And the, and the basic statement that you, that Lara has emphasized is that you know, if you have a metric on PN, you have a metric on the club, yeah, right? So what is a metric? It's just a notion of length. So if this is PN, here's the hypersurface X, which is the, the quintic, the solution of P5 equals zero. This is gonna, by taking two derivatives to get a metric, this is gonna give me a notion of length everywhere on this space. So in particular, it gives me length along this club, yeah. So this gives me a metric on the club, yeah. What is that metric? Well, if I regard these um, uh, users as giving me an embedding map, so say that my coordinates on the Kalabi Yau are going to be yi, so those are actually coordinates on the Kalabi Yau, then given a point on the Kalabi Yau that specifies a point in the ambient space, which is where that point on the Kalabi Yau lies, and that's just an embedding. It's an embedding map telling me how this point on the Kalabi Yau is living in the ambient space, and so you can get your your metric on the club yow by just pulling back the metric on the ambient space under that embedding map. Or, you know, just using the chain rule. G Fubini study, A, B bar. So we're done, everybody go home. It's not the Rishi flat metric, right? So it is easy to get metrics on club yow manifolds. It is super easy. You can even do it analytically. You can write it down. It's not Rishi flat. It's in the right class to be Rishi flat, but it's not Rishi flat. So not Rishi flat. So metric on X, but not Rishi flat. Nevertheless, this is actually closer to giving you a Rishi flat metric, this kind of structure than you may think. Um, and that's what we're gonna look at. So to get the actual metric ansatz that we're gonna use, I'm gonna sort of phrase it in two ways, the sort of dirty grubby physicist way that applies to me, and then something that's ever so slightly more refined um, to just have something that's telling us why this has a chance of work. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna generalize that Fubini study Kähler potential. And the basic idea is we're gonna make it more general by instead of having linears, you see I've got GAB bar, ZA, ZB bar there in this Fubini study Kähler potential. Instead of just having linears like that, we're going to replace them with degree k polynomials. And then we're going to take a punt and hope that that's good enough to somehow give us a Calabian manifold. Math will tell us the punt is a sensible punt. So how are we going to generalize a Kähler potential like that? Well, if you're a physicist and you want to like write down a function with a bunch of parameters in it, you might think about doing some kind of expansion, right? You may say, I'm going to write down a a function that's expanded in some set of modes and I'll give each mode a coefficient and Bob's your uncle off we go, right? And so what modes 
might you use in expanding some function? Well, you might look at eigenvalues of the Laplacian, right? So the first K eigenspaces, first K eigenspaces of the Laplacian on Pn are spanned by the following set of functions. Here I'm going to take k equals zero is going to be the constant function. And after that, you can write the following. pk, I'll, I'll say what everything is in just a sec. Over g a b bar over a to the k. Okay, so what do we have here? These are degree k polynomials. I is just the index that runs over all the different possibilities. So if you like, you just take the degree k monomials and go over them. Conjugates, mission matrix as well, as before. Um, this thing's on the bottom with this power of k. So I have the same power of z and, uh, on the top and the bottom so that uh, the scaling cancels out. There you go, there's some modes. Let's just expand a k in terms of those. When you do that, there's a problem. You could do that. So you can just expand a Kähler potential in terms of those. You can get a Kähler potential in the ambient space. You can pull it back, get a Kähler potential on the club Yao or a metric on the club Yao. You can start trying to tune the parameters to get Rishi flatness. And when you do that, you find those flat directions. There's tunings of the parameters that just don't change anything at all on the club Yao. And that's kind of numerically a problem, right? Because you, you, you're dealing with more parameters than you need. And, They've got nowhere to go. They just sit there like a potato, right? So, so why is that happening? Well, on the club Yao, let's call the club Yao X. I don't know if we've done that already. So on X, uh, these are redundant. And the reason for that is very simple. If you have a polynomial PKI, a degree K polynomial, then on the club Yao, if you just look at it on the club Yao, you restrict it to the club Yao, that's equivalent to any other polynomial, which is a degree, I'm gonna do the quintic here, but generalization is obvious, a degree K minus five polynomial times the defining equation, the defining polynomial of the quintic, the thing that you set to zero to get the club Yao manifold. On the, the club Yao, those two are the same, for obvious reasons, right? The club Yao is defined by P def equals zero. That's how you find the, so like, these two obviously become the same. So you want to remove that redundancy. So you're not including something multiple times, so multiple different things that will reduce to the same thing on the quintic. So we remove the redundancy. And what you'll get is some, you'll just choose one element of each equivalence class here, and we'll just call the, the smaller set of degree K polynomials, you get small p, and I'll give them a capital A index because it'll run over a different. Okay, so we've got a basis of functions. We're just gonna expand our Kähler potential in terms of those. There's many ways you could do that. We're gonna to choose to do it a specific way. You could try other ways, there's nothing wrong with it, but we're gonna do it this way because it will tie in nicely with some math results. So we're just gonna take on patch C, we're gonna take the same Kähler potential we had before the Fabini study. And then we're gonna add with a factor of one over K, log of H A B bar, and then these eigenfunctions. Again, we want things real. So this better be Hermitian. These are our parameters H. So H is actually a central letter for parameters because it's Hermitian matrix. These are gonna be our parameters, right? So the idea is this is a set of Kähler potentials currently on the ambient space. Give me a metric on the ambient space. Therefore, I can pull it back and get a metric on the club here. You can, if you use that formula, which probably off, no, just at the top of the board for the Kähler potential for Bini study, you plug it into this, you can simplify this down. And this just becomes one over K log H A B bar, P A K, P bar, B bar K over mod Z C squared. 
Okay, that's kind of why there's one, one of the reasons one okay factor is there. It's just allowing me to combine these two to swap this bottom out here for just ZC to the 2K. And that means that if you write it in terms of my affine coordinates on the patch, this is going to become one over K log H A B bar B A K of these U's, the affine coordinates. So it really is just like for Bini study. I mean, I could have started by writing this down as the guess. I was just trying to give some kind of motivation, right? I could have just, in Fuduini study, these were linears. Now they're just any degree k. So you can do that. And if you want to, you can be really dumb about it and just try it and see. And if it works, you're good, right? You don't need any theory. You can just go for the gusto. Um, you could do similarly go for the gusto with any other ansatz you came up with. But there's actually a reason why this succeeds. And so it's good to look at that. And there's also a sort of geometric interpretation for what this actually means beyond I'm just going to take some linears and replace them with some higher degree polynomials. But let's look at how that works. So probability of success. Am I going to be able, using this Allen Zatz, to get close to a Ricci flat man manifold? This is going to be a bit more mathy. If you don't know what I'm saying, just completely ignore me. I'll tell you when to tune back in. Just for the, the folks who've seen a bit of this before, because it's a mixed audience, this is useful to know. So on, a club, on the club Yao, the above, what I'm talking about with this redundancy is these little polynomials PK are actually sections of the line bundle OK on the quintet. Okay. And in particular, therefore, you can write this if you like. As H0 of L to the K, there are elements of H0 L to the K, uh, where L is O1. So these are just particular sections of particular line bundles. Why on earth would you care? Um, you care because of a theorem by Tian, whose name I'm also probably butchering. That's a theorem. I think it's butchering. Uh, so let PAK, set of all of them, be a basis for the global sections of, of some L to the K for some line bundle A for, for some L. Probably don't need to write that. Then the space of algebraic Kähler potentials. That's the Kähler potential we just write down, wrote down. It's called the algebraic Kähler potential. Where you allow K to be any Z, so that you allow degree to be anything, is dense in the space of all K. In other words, if you push the polynomial degree high enough, you can approximate literally any Kähler potential this way. So if the degree goes high enough, it will work. So that's kind of why you're really making this approximation. It doesn't tell you it's practically going to work, right? Maybe K needs to be 10 billion, but you got a shot. I think I got time for this. This kind of looks sensible, right? We're saying as you raise k, as you raise the degree of the polynomials you're looking at, there's more and more polynomials. So there's more and more of these parameters h. We've got more and more things to tune. If you've got more dials to tune, you're likely to be able to get nearer and nearer to Calabi out. But you may ask, like, geometrically, what is this metric? Is there a nice sort of interpretation for what we're doing? And there is, and it's very close to what we did to get a metric on the Club Yao that wasn't Rishi flat way back at the start. I think I've got time to let me just mention it briefly. So this is interpreting the algebraic metric. Let's give it a name, K-A, the K algebraic. 
So what we're going to do is use our basis of polynomials that we're using to define an embedding. So we're going to use the PAKs to define a map. And it's going to be a map from the club Yao to a whack and great big projective space. So it's a projective space where this is the number of these, these polynomials minus one. Okay. How do we define that map? Well, you just take some point on the club Yao and we, we give that point in terms of the homogeneous coordinates in PN of that point on the club Yao. And then the image of that is just gonna be, you just map it to these polynomials. Going. And these are going to be the homogeneous coordinates of this big projective space. That's what you hit. So is this a good map? Well, if this is going to be mapping to projective space, it better be that all of these polynomials can't simultaneously vanish. But of course, they're polynomials built out of the homogeneous coordinates of, of Pn, which can't all simultaneously vanish. So indeed, you're good. Also, there's a scaling here, right? So. Um, on both sides, there's a scaling and they better be compatible that we're mapping actually points on projective space to points on projective space. But you can see that works out. These, if these homogeneous coordinates scale with some lambda, these just scale with lambda to k. And so there's, there's nice scaling on both sides and it sort of matches out. So this is a good map on projective space. And we need one more thing for the geometric interpretation that I'm going to mention to work nicely. We want this map to be an embedding. Second drop of the day. So how do we get that? What do I mean by that? Just for folks who aren't used to it. So embedding, not embedding. So if this is PN, got X just nicely laying inside there. If PN does horrible things like cross itself, that's not an embedding, it's an immersion. So we need it to like lie nicely in the space. We need it to be an embedding. And mathematically that will happen. We will get an embedding. So I is an embedding. If, um, if L is very ample. So there's just some condition on the line bundle, you know, whose powers, the sections of which are our polynomials for, for that to, to work. And for the quintic, that's true. If, if k is bigger than or equal to one. So it's just always going to be true for us. So we have a nice embedding. These, these sections that we've been talking about, these, these polynomials that we built our ansatz for the Kähler potential out of, define an embedding from the club Yau into some whacking great projective space. Right? If you're dealing with high degree polynomials, this thing is huge. But it's a nice, you can get a nice, nice embedding. So what is our Kähler potential? Well, remember our Kähler potential is just built out of these P's in this simple way. But if these P's are now the coordinates on your projective space, this bigger projective space, this is just Fubini study. But it's Fubini study on this whacking great projective space. So what you're actually doing is you're just finding embeddings of the club Yao into bigger and bigger and bigger prop, uh, copies of projective space as you raise the degree of these polynomials. And then you're just pulling back the, 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 the known metric, the Fubini study metric to get a metric on, on, on the club Yao. Sorry? Well, I guess that would follow from the proof of Chen's theorem and I've, I've not got something pithy I can, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A good, the question was, is there any intuition as to why this works? If you want a pithy intuition, it's just that like you're getting more parameters. But beyond that, this is what Chen, Chen's work's called. The last thing on this ANSATS, I'm spending a long time on the ANSATS. For the last thing on this ANSATS, let's just actually think about how much trouble we're in. So that's the end of the interpretation. This is the, the, the chat we're gonna be using. How much trouble are we in numerically? Right. So the idea here is we're going to tune these parameters so that the metric becomes club Yao. How many parameters are there? 
number of H's. Um, well, we've got homogeneous coordinates of degree K. I'm coming all the way around, goodness. So the number of degree K polynomials in N variables is, or oh, homogeneous, is K plus N choose K. For those of you who haven't seen it, there's a, a really cute little proof of that. Um, I don't think I have, I don't think I have time to go through it. So if you're interested, just catch me at the break. It's just so cute. It's just Anyway, this is the number of polynomials that you can write down if degree k in, in Pn, so in n plus 1 variables. And we have to remove redundancy, remember. We're not including every polynomial, because if two polynomials reduce to be the same thing on the Calabi L, we don't want to include them both. So for our, this would be the number of our big k, p's that had no redundancy removal. For the little p's, so the ones where we own, if two polynomials are related by a multiple of the defining relation of the club, yeah, we only keep one of them, there, there's slightly less. So how many of these polynomials are there? So if um, the degree is less than five for the quintic or is less than the degree of the defining relation, then we'll just get the same number because the polynomial couldn't be proportional to the quintic if it's degree four, say. So that's if K is less than, one. Um, and in the other case, we just had that you, you take a degree k minus five polynomial and you multiply it by the quintic and that gives you a degree k polynomial and those are the things we are subtracting off. So we just have to subtract off the number of those. And if you just use this formula to do that, you get this. So that's if k is greater than n. Inequalities are now right. You get what I mean. So how many of those are there? Well, it goes as k to the n minus one. So as you scale up um, the degree of polynomials, it goes as, as the n to the minus one power. So for the quintic, if you work out what this looks like at large k, it goes as five six k five plus k squared, or in real money. If you do just plot of k against number, it doesn't on the face of it look too bad. So five, six, seven, eight, nine. You just sort of do 125, 205, 315, 460, 645. And you think ah, it's growing, it's not too bad. The numbers, they don't, I'm not particularly looking forward to dealing with 645 parameters, but all right, that's good. But you've got to remember that the parameters are H. It is a matrix with two indices. Right, so if you look at actually at H, you're totally screwed. So the number of parameters H that you're actually gonna have to deal with, I mean, it starts at 15,000. Am I doing that right? Anyway, and goes to 416,025. What I'm saying is it grows quick, right? And that, that's bad news bears. Um, and if you um, use the classical methods I'm talking about now, not the machine learning methods, but if you use the classical methods I'm going to talk about here, no one has worked at a generic point in moduli space because the number of parameters is just too big. You have to do something about this or the methods ain't finished, as far as I'm aware. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So basically you're expanding this, this, um, this Kähler potential in the space of basis polynomials. So for every basis polynomial, you have a parameter. As the degree goes up, the number of parameters, as you know, like the number of polynomials is also so just the number of parameters. And now you've just got too many parameters to adjust. You may be thinking, hey, I saw machine learning implementations where the number of parameters were quite large, maybe, right, precisely, right? But in these classical methods, this was deadly. And so what people have to do is they have to find a way to reduce the number of parameters. And the, to do this, they use symmetries. This, to be clear, is a cheat. It's a sensible cheat. They're doing something smart. This is not something you want to impose, but you're imposing it so, it so that you can get an answer. So how do we reduce the number of parameters? We're going to impose a symmetry. So you choose a special Calabial, a special Quintic, such that you have a lot of symmetry. 
So the one that's not universally, but almost universally used in the literature is the Fermat Quintic, which Lara mentioned. So you take P5 defining. This could be an arbitrary degree five polynomial in the coordinates of P4, right? There's like 126 terms that you could write down. And instead people write down Z naught to the five plus Z one to the five plus Z four to the five. That's the specialization. But if you don't impose something like this, you're doomed on these classical models. So why does that help us? We now have symmetries. So we can permute all the coordinates. Right? And this doesn't change. That's symmetry. You can take literally all of the coordinates and you can multiply them by a fifth root of unity and that fifth root of unity can be different for each coordinate. So, um, that's a symmetry. You can complex conjugate the thing. That might, one's not obvious here, right? But um, you know, if you're setting P equals to zero, you're also setting P bar equals zero. So because we have both Z and Z bar appearing in our Caleb potential ansatz, um, you, if you have two um, contributions to the ansatz, which just have the Zs and the Z bars swapped, you can set them equal. And so if you do that, you can reduce the numbers from these hundreds of thousands to um, uh, uh, K equals nine. So the order of the discrete groups uh, on this case is 150,000. Notice for the experts, it's not freely acting, right? So you can't quotient by this or anything, but it's a symmetry. That raises questions, by the way, but it's a symmetry. You can use it to reduce your ansatz. I'm only going to include polynomials in my expansion of the Kähler potential that represent that, um, that respect the symmetry. And then what happens is that k equals nine, so degree nine polynomials, you're just left with order 10 parameters. That's better. If you want to see a plot of how this looks, um, there's a very nice one in the Hedrick and Massar paper that I gave at the start. As I said, this is some thing that we'll see improvement. I'm going super slow. So one last thing I want to mention. We now have the ansatz. In principle, you can now sit down, write yourself an ansatz. You could do this pullback. To, you, know, you could do these derivatives of the coordinates to get the metric on the Calabiao, and you could start to play with it. Um, but there's one trick that's very useful to note. So I'm not going to. Like write down lots of algebra um, in how you do all of that. For you. I'm just going to exercise for the reader, but there's one trick that's like immensely useful to remember to get things on the club yeah. So um, if you're on the club yeah, so here's PN, and I'm going to really zoom into a small open set now. I'm just looking at a small part of the club yeah, so I'm just writing one branch there, not five for the quintic. Um, on some small parts like that, we can use any subset of um, n minus one affine coordinates as our Calabi our coordinates. So I'm just saying, right, so if it's two dimensional here, if I zoom in enough, if I, if I give you that coordinate, well, that coordinate is specified by solving the club, yeah, right? So by asking that one on the line, if I specify that coordinate, I say where I am on the line. So what I'm saying, if our club, club, if our club, yeah, coordinates, we call them yi, we can just take them equal to uic, where i is not equal to c or delta. c was the one that we set not equal to zero for the patch, so ui, ucc is one. And delta is the coordinate that we're choosing to emit. So then the idea is you would just solve the Calabi-Yau equation, p def equals zero, to get u delta of c, the last one, as a function of the yi's. Trouble is that solving is going to be a pain in the butt, right? You don't want to sit there and solve a quintic equation every time you want to. Um, Take a derivative of something. So your your functions are all going to depend on these u's as we've seen. But the derivatives with respect to the uic's are going to be easy because they're just your Calabi-Yau coordinates. But this one's going to be a pain because I'd have to solve the quintic to find out what function it is of y. And there's just a kind of obvious trick. But if you miss it, 
you can waste half your life doing algebra. So, so if I've got some function of these u's, y. So it's on the club yow. So I specify a point on the club yow. It gives a point in this patch, and I've got a function of that. And I want to just take a derivative with respect to the club yow coordinates. What am I going to get? Well, just by obviously by chain rule, I'll get that the derivatives with respect to the the UIs will be very simple, just because the UIs are the club yow coordinates. But then there's a chain rule issue in that f also depends on this last remaining coordinate that we're solving the defining for relation for. So I have to include I have to include that. So f is a function of all the u's, not just the ones we've taken to club yow coordinates. And and you know I don't want to have to solve the club yow equation and plug that in here. So all you do is just point out that if p def equals zero everywhere on the club yow, then di of p def. So by di I mean d by dyi of that also equals zero because you're just going along the club yow and it doesn't change. And so that is going to be equal to just pulling the same trick dp def by dui plus d def by du delta. So it's the same thing I just wrote up, but instead of f, I'm just doing it for the particular function, which is the Flabio defining relation. So that's going to be true. So if you just apply this to the particular function of the Flabio defining relation, you get something that you can easily solve this. So you're just going to get that. Um, so if I solve this equation for this, and I plug it back in there, if I call pi def dp def by dui, and then similarly for delta, then you're just going to get that derivatives on the club yow of functions are just the derivatives with respect to these coordinates that you're using to describe the club yow minus quotient of two polynomials that are trivial to work out from the club yow defining relation. And then another derivative that's simple to take. It, you don't have to solve the club yow defining relation. That's all I'm saying. So if that was, if I, boring people were blown away, not all I'm saying is look out, there's a, there's a trick for not having to solve the club yow defining relation. If I blew you away, check out Hedrick. He has, he has it. Okay, so. After a long time, we have the ansatz. That's everything we need. And now we just got to tune the parameters. That's all we've got to do, right? Um, and there are two methods in the literature that are commonly used. I'm sure I'm missing something, but those are the two that everybody talks about a lot of the time. Now we get, so that's the end of the metric ansatzes. So now we're going to be tuning the parameters, tuning H to try and get uh, a Calabia manifold, a Rishi flat metric. On a manifold. And there's two commonly used ways. Um, there's the Donaldson algorithm. This was sort of the OG method. So this is um, something that was sort of taken by people like Mike Douglas out of the math literature and used um, in, in the physics literature to find some of these metrics we're interested in. And what you do here is you have some operator that we'll see as we go along. And you iterate it. So it's sort of some operator, you give some H's, you iterate an operator, you get some new H's, and you keep going. And eventually you hit a fixed point, and those fixed points are your approximate H's. You plug them back into your metric ansatz, and it gives you something that's close to club. Yeah. We're not going to focus on that one for two reasons. I am going to go through it. Um, yes, please. Why is it necessarily true that it's so close to club? Yeah, yeah, that's far from obvious. We're going to have to go through it. Yeah, I'm just sort of giving a very coarse overview. It's not, I haven't even told you what the operator is, right? So it's far from obvious that something like that could work. And Donaldson did some wonderful work to, sh to show that it's true. I'm not going to focus on that one for two reasons. One, at least classically, it doesn't do as well as the other method. And there's reasons why that's true. And they're il il illustrative methods, which is why we're going to talk about the illustrative reasons. And that's why we're going to talk about Donaldson at all. And second of all, for most, but not all, of the machine learning applications, the other method is used. So the other method is what we're going to really focus on. And that's minimization. of an appropriate functional. And given 
what lectures we've been seeing, right? I'm telling you, we're going to minimize, we're going to have a functional that takes in this ansatz and you minimize it and it gives you the right parameters to get the reach, but you should be, your head should be screaming loss, loss function, right? And that's going to be kind of true. So these are the two types of methods we're going to do. And as I said, we're going to start with the latter, um, just so that um, we make sure we get the pieces we need there. And then I'll talk briefly about Donaldson. So let me start setting up some preamble here. Um, just so I can really dive into the functionals properly next time. I may get to one of them. So um, we're going to define some things. So preamble, I guess. We're going to take um, a measure, a top form, omega omega bar on the, the Calabi-L. This is a top form, so you could use it to integrate over the Calabi-L. The beauty of this beast is it is exactly and precisely known. Lara actually gave you a formula for this omega at the end of the last time. It's basically just wedge products of D of coordinates over a derivative of the defining relation. So you know this exact this thing exactly. It's real. That's this factor of i here. The n here is just the dimension of the club. Yeah. This is just so that this um, this thing is real. And the beauty of it is it is known. We so we got that one. We're also gonna. Um, uh, given the Kähler form, so that's just like the metric. That's the um, the double derivative of the Kähler potential, right? But anti-symmetrized rather than symmetric. Given the Kähler form J, we're going to define a function which Hedrick in particular calls V. I have no re idea actually why he calls it V, but J to the n over n factorial mu. That looks weird because I'm taking a top form. So J, if it's two derivatives, it's a two form. So if you take N powers of it on an N-dimensional complex manifold, that's a top form. I'm dividing two forms. Top forms are all proportional to each other. So I can divide them and it just gives me a function. And if you were to work this out um, in terms of sort of components in sort of a grubby way, it's sort of the determinant of this IJ bar matrix. So it's almost the metric. Um, and then the non-zero component of omega mod squared on the bottom. Also real. Um, so why are we defining that function? We're defining that function because it has lots of nice properties that allow us to write things down simply. So in particular, if V equals constant, right, then what does that mean from this definition and from the definition from mu? Well, that would then mean that one over n factorial j to the nth power, j to the wedge to n times, is a constant C omega omega bar. And that's the Mont Ampere equation. This is the equation that Lara told us Yao proved is equivalent to having a Ricci flat metric, modulo some stuff. All right, so if V is a constant, if you plug in your J up here and you get a constant V, you plug in your Kähler potential, you get a constant V then you have a Rishi flat metric. There's also a nice form for the Rishi tensor in terms of V, which is that R I J bar is equal to minus D I D J bar log V. This is actually the same form that Lara wrote down at the end of last lecture. Um, that may look a bit strange because, okay, I'm happy with you know, this is basically saying that the Ricci potential is a double derivative of log that G. That's actually the formula Lara had. But uh, why is omega appearing? <laughs> but if you look, this is mod squared. So when you put it in the log, you just get a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic piece. And then you take two derivatives, so it just goes away. Okay, I'm gonna push it. I've got five minutes. So we're gonna do the first function. So given these definitions, we can start to just write down functionals. Things that you plug your metric into, and if you minimize them, then the parameters that minimize the functional will give you the closest approximation you can get to a, a Rishi flat metric. So the first one we're going to talk about is the Mont Ampere functional. Um, this is the one that 
uh, Hedrick uses and everybody uses also as an error message of how far away you are from Flubby. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Type of error, type of functional that should be looked familiar from Fabian's lectures. So what do we have here? We just have mu, our known top form that we can integrate with, and then sort of mean squared deviation type thing of v. So here, the average of v is just what it sounds like, right? So average of v is just going to be um, integral of x of mu v, the integral of x of mu. What's nice about this functional? Um, so remember, v is determined in terms of j. j is determined in terms of k. It's just two derivatives of k. So what you would do, though this looks simple, you would take your Kähler potential ansatz, you'd plug it into all of the above equations, and you get down to here, and you have something that depends on, on all the parameters in your ansatz. So what's the nice properties of this, this functional? It's positive semi-definite, obviously. Uh, with a global minimum, zero, at v equals the average of v. And that's a constant. Okay. So from what we just said, that means its global minimum is when the mondrian pair equation is satisfied. So if you minimize this and you get zero, then you have a Rishi flat metric by Yalston. Other nice properties of this functional? Uh, it has no other critical points. Let me just calculate and show that. And rather nicely, it has no derivatives of j in it. Right. So you have to take derivatives of your Kähler potential, but you don't then have to like compute a curvature of something. Right, and end up with four derivatives like Lara was talking about, or something like that, right? So this one's awesome. This one's awesome. And you know, obviously, in a machine learning application, I just wrote up a loss function. Right? It's the thing you minimize to. But what, um, and we'll talk about this as we go along, what Hedrick and Masai actually did is when they used these symmetries to reduce the number of parameters in their ansatz, they plugged it into Mathematica and just did find minimum in Mathematica. And they were clever enough with their use of symmetries that that actually works on a laptop in real time. And to compare to the machine learning techniques, I think maybe in the last tutorial, you may actually, you may actually do some of that. Because you can find their code online. Um, give, I, I really should stop, but um, I, I will give just a heads up of what the other functional is gonna be, and then we'll talk about its properties next time. The other functional, as you might imagine, is gonna be the, that we'll discuss, is going to be the Rishi functional. The other thing you could try and do is minimize something. The reason for these factors will become clear when I talk next time. That's just the Rishi scalar. And actually, you can show that that thing only has a minimum when the Rishi tensor vanishes. Um, and, oh, you know that from GR. And um, uh, this is another thing that you can plug things into to try and minimize. This one's a little bit more sucky, at least in classical techniques, because it involves more derivatives and stuff. It, it classically, in the types of techniques that don't involve machine learning, it tends to work less well. But we'll talk about that next time, um, and I'll stop there and say uh, any more questions. There's none catch me yet. Oh. Well, I have a quick question. Oh. I've actually never seen the analytic method on the cubic elliptic elliptic curve. Like, you know, the baby case. Yeah, I believe I've it's never. possible. I've never written it down. Uh, yeah. Do you know? No, I have not. Did you do that? Part? It's an hour last idea. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's, an, it's an hour last idea. What do you, what do you get? I you get it. Eventually, you get Thank you.